Okay, so good morning. We are at Agent Rising Real Estate School. I'm Kate Lanigan McGregor, and we are doing client representation agreements today. Okay, so. Is this? Oh, I'm waiting. I'll just text you this one. Uh -huh. Ah, there we go. Um, so the first thing to do is, again, to maximize this unit, is to have your audio going and um, by the way, I, I had recorded, when I was at the National Association of Realtors, I had a, a recorded some of the, the things like this when I was there, and when I was driving to my thing yesterday, I listened to one. And then I was driving home, I was too tired, so I didn't listen to anything. But, so, you know, it's a great thing. Use that car for your audio, okay? Um, and, and then you're going to also, did anyone, I have not visited the forum. I know I promised you guys on Tuesday I was going to check it out. The forum on agentrising.com. They're always... What are the keys for distance learning, which we're not quite at yet? By the way, I get an update. We are close. They have a, they have a, they've approved of it in concept for Massachusetts. <laughs> so now that just has to go through the channels. So what that means is I know um, some of you have talked about the kids who you thought might want to take it, or you know you may want to, um, well, you guys have been awesome about being here, but um, if you had those hours that you had to make up or whatever. Um, but anyway, so distance learning is in our, in our not too distant future. Some of your friends that you have that might be interested in taking it but can't make this class, who don't want to spend a week with me, <laughs> they can come. To, they can do the distance learning. Okay, and uh, just so you know, the way that the distance learning will be set up will be this slide presentation with audio clips and with video clips. Okay, so we first tried it out that we just went through the whole thing, and um, we didn't like it, so we're, we're changing it up a little bit. Okay, all right, so. So client representation agreements is the agreements by which a broker can be employed to act for a seller or buyer A client representation agreements. The most common are listing agreements and buyer representation agreements. And again, we spoke about this the other day. We talked about that neither one has to be in writing in order to be valid. However, a statute of frauds in Massachusetts says that if it's to be enforceable, it has to be in writing. How come you're way back there? Where you come up from? Um, okay. <laughs> So I, th I think that when you're on the way back like that, at, at my sales meetings, I never let anyone stay in the back. But I'll let you for now. Maybe when we shift it up. Okay, so our chapter objectives are to describe the different types of listing agreements and causes for termination. Describe the listing presentation and the information needed for a listing agreement. <coughs> Identify and explain the listing agreement terms and the responsibilities of both parties. And describe the type of buyer representation agreements and the causes for termination. So those are some of the things that we're going to cover today. Okay? Um, the key terms to record, um, so you're going to review them, you're going to record them. Buyer representation agreement, comparative market analysis, exclusive agency listing, exclusive buyer representation agreement, exclusive right to sell listing, multiple service listing, net listing, and open listing. Okay, so representing the seller. So the types of listing agreements are these four, which is exclusive right to sell, exclusive agency listing, exclusive open listing, and net listing. So we're going to talk about each of them, okay? The first is exclusive right to sell, or what you will see abbreviated by its four letters, which is E-R, well, E-R-T-S, actually, exclusive right to sell, okay? And what that is, is that when you enter into this agreement with the consumer, they are, by the time you are done with that, and then when that is valid, you are, you are promised to your, your commission or your compensation no matter who sells the property. So this is the strongest <coughs> kind of link for the listing agreements. Um, it's what we most of the time do, almost always. So what that means is that you put the house on the market and that neighbor comes knocking on the door to, to talk to the person who's got the sign out there. And they say, oh, you know, I, wish you, I wish you knew you were selling your house. You know, um, I want to buy it. And so even if that happens, you are entitled to your compensation, okay? So that means regardless of who sells it, you get your compensation, okay? Now we talked to, well, I'm not going to actually get into it right now. Exclusive agency listing. These are also called exclusive, there's another word for them, exclusive office listing, I think, or something. Is it in there? What is it? Does it say in there? Uh, exclusive agency listing, is that the only way that they describe it? Okay. Somewhere we're going to see it exclusive. I think it's called exclusive office listing, which doesn't make any sense, but that's what it's. Exclusive agency listing? 
That was exclusive agency listing is what we call them. Yeah. And that's what's in here. But there's another name for them. That'll pop up somewhere and then we'll just reference it. Okay, an exclusive agency listing is similar to the exclusive right to sell in that they hire you to sell the property. However, the owner retains the right to sell it themselves. Okay, so that's the big difference on that. Okay, so when I told you before about our menu of services that we have with clients and that we help them get it out through the multi-listing service, however, we also give them the right to sell it themselves. So it's, if the procuring cause is us or another agent, they are entitled to the compensation. If they got it themselves, then they would, they would not be responsible for that commission. Okay, there are some companies that use this as their business model, you know, for everything. Uh, and that they're like, well, you know, you, you find your buyer, you know, there's no risk in listing with us because if you find your buyer, you know, you can sell it yourself. We don't do that, but uh, that, is, that is one up. The next is an open listing. And an open listing is when the homeowner or the seller enters into agreements with several brokers or brokerages <coughs> and offers them all the ability to sell his, their property. Okay, so basically what they say is, I will enter into agreement with you, and if you sell it, you get the compensation. And I'll enter into an agreement with you, and if you sell it, you get the, the commission. And so, so they throw it out there. And this was done in times of uh, when the market was very hot and things were selling very quickly. And so they just kind of wanted to open it up. At this stage of the game, the real life practice of it is that for, a, um, for an agent, it doesn't make a lot of sense to market it, take the time to put it on MLS to, to do this, if everybody else is also doing it. So, um, or, or spend the, the money to market it, you know. However, it is still an option available for sellers. And then the last is a net listing, which is illegal. And this is when the seller says, listen, I just want X amount of dollars. Anything that you sell it for over that, you get to keep, okay? And they always picture on this one, like a little old lady, you know, sitting in a little cottage down by the water, you know. And she's like, well, I bought it for $5,000. I guess all I really want is, you know, $50,000. And you sell it for like $500,000, you know. So that's like the idea of it. That's the image that they talk about. And that, that, that's why they say it's, it's illegal is that, you know, we are taking advantage of our consumers, okay? That being said, you will often meet with a seller and they say, this is what I need to clear. or this is what I need. What can we do with those numbers? And then you mentally tack on your commission, the tax stamps, the quoting fees, and, and you kind of give them an idea about what that number would be. And then you would back into it from there and say, let's see if we can make those numbers work with comparables. You know, so there's a lot of times that happens. However, it is not a net listing. Net listings are illegal, okay? Um, and uh, anyway, so listings involved with co cooperating brokers, okay, the multi-listing service. So we talked the other day, I think we, we phrased it as IDX in that, you know, the in internet data exchange of listings. And what the multi-listing service does is it promises, so you get it out there, the multi-listing service then feeds that, inter remember we talked about the internet, it feeds it to all of the websites that are possibly going to pick it up from like NewYorkTimes.com, Realtor.com, Trulia, Zillow. Um, every company's websites, like it goes everywhere from the fact of you putting it in there and then it's fed out, okay? The thing that's a value to realtors is there's also a promise of compensation in there for the buyer's agent, okay? So we are compensating that person who brings the buyer in, okay? And we're and re rewarding them for bringing that buyer, okay? So now we're getting into a tricky age. And this is something that's going to be transitioning in your lifetime of selling real estate in that you know, there's a for sale by owner, I think, on Trulia. And I, and I don't know if it's Zillow or Trulia, is it? Because they, they both are owned by the same person. So is it Trulia, right? I think it's Trulia that you can put it on for sale by owner. So, and there's also a coming soon attraction in which realtors can put their listings on um, Trulia and Zillow, I think. Um, in which, when they go there, they still get fed out. Most people who are looking are using those consumer-facing websites. They get the most traffic. However, what's not there? A yeah. promise of compensation. So what happens is this agent goes and they put their sign up. They put it in as coming soon. A consumer calls them directly. 
right? Because it's there, and so the, the, the buyer's agent conceivably is, is cut out. Okay, it also puts the buyer's agent in a tough position if the, if the buyer comes to them and says, listen, I wanna go see this house. And so then you go and you say to the person, to the other realtor, you know, listen, I have a buyer for this. And it's like, oh, that's not an MLS yet. So what they're saying, in so many words, maybe, is I don't want to pay you <laughs> because it's not, I haven't promised you a payment yet, you know? And so it's, it's really a game changer for us. So we've had to kind of carve our way into figuring out how we're going to get compensated, if we're going to get compensated, how we open up those lines of communication. Um, now, as the code of ethics, we, we promise fairness to each other, you know, and as companies, there's different policies and there's different, you know, relationships that are established, but it's not in writing. Okay, there's nothing that's gonna make them do it. You know, um, I had a buyer not too long ago who, he was, actually, he was actually related to me, and we've been working together for a long time. But he's also, he took my real estate class, and he knows just, and I told him this when I was being mean, I'm like, you know, just enough to be dangerous, you know? Like, um, so he, like the sign goes up, so he goes and, you know, talks to the realtor. Because, you know, he's, he's, in his mind, he's half a realtor himself, you know? And he's, you know, and, it's, and so he established this relationship with him. And then he saw the house with him because he was there and the guy was hanging up the sign and he went inside and, you know, and so he had a couple of these chance meetings with them, but it had not been on MLS yet. They were doing the coming soon feature. So now he comes to me and says, I want you to represent me. You know, and now I'm like, oh. So we talked about procuring cause, right? He's been in the house. The sign was, was the thing that, that got him into it. You know, I was not that, that, that thing that got him there. I was not the first, I did, did not start that chain of procurement, right? But however, he wants help with the negotiating, he wants help with the, the paperwork, he wants help with the other advocacy, you know, that he thinks is really what a realtor is for, you know? So now I'm in a position that he wants representation. He's already established this chain of procurement. And, and so I was like, oh. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do because it's like you go to the person and, and sometimes it's a no, well, whatever. So I ended up, in this particular case, offering a, a different fee, fee structure than what we normally have because I felt like that was fair and reasonable. But it pissed me off because I'm like, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> you know, because it's frustrating. You know, we have a system in place and now there's these game-changing things that are happening and they're not wrong, they're not illegal. It's not the way we've done it and it's not the way that, you know, perhaps our culture, you know, our, our culture in Bobo is you know, we, we want to honor relationships, you know? So anyways, it's, it's, it's tough and it's getting a little tricky, but it's that MLS entry. The other thing, and I don't think this is gonna get into it, so I'm gonna just talk about this a little bit longer, is there is a change from the National Association of Realtors on how they feel that information is gonna be dispersed. Again, as a result of big data in the internet, they, and they have this thing called Project Upstream. This won't be on the test, so I'm only gonna spend one minute on it, but the gist of it is, is that MLS, it normally goes listings to MLS to people, right? Now what, it, what they're saying is the listings are going to go to this, this, this thing called Upstream, and then from Upstream, there's gonna be, from there it gets distributed to your websites and other places you may put it, and then also MLS, but MLS is not the first stop anymore. And what they're saying is MLS is not gonna be the only way that you do business. We haven't gotten there. We don't know what it's going to look like. It is a. It is definitely going to be something that's going to, you know, happen. You know, I don't know how or when or what it's going to look like. Um, termination of <coughs> seller representation uh, agreements. Uh, so here, here's how we could terminate. Uh, the, the agreement's purpose is fulfilled. The term expires. The property is destroyed. <coughs> title transferred by operation of law. We talked about that bankruptcy and foreclosure. Mutual agreement, breach, or one party dies or becomes <coughs> incapacitated. Okay? So this is how these things, these agreements are terminated. And I'm just gonna kind of caution you that this one right here where the term expires, as it expires, you need to have your paperwork follow where you're going. You know, so get the get the extensions or get the new agreements in place because, you know, there's so many stories of of the people, something else coming up. After, you know, this ex term expires, but you still have it on MLS for them, you have a, you know, an outside agreement with them, or you have a verbal agreement with them to extend. So it's just, just beware. 
if you've worked with a buyer and then your term expires, but you had a buyer that wasn't interested in the beginning and then came back, uh, do you have any... Um, so do you mean like, okay, so you showed a buyer a property? Yes, and, and then your they, term expired on and your then listing. And they went back to the property? And then they, went, then they came back to you and changed their mind and wanted to buy it and you'd lost your, your if they listing use, agreement. Right, if, okay, so both the, so that's like a two-part two, two part question. One is there's a protection in the listing agreement and also in the buyer agency agreement that if you've established a relationship with that person, there's a period of time after that if they went back without you, that you're entitled to an agreement, your compensation. So there's that piece of it. The other piece is that what I think you were asking was, even after the agreement's over, if, if there's a way that you can work together, can you work together if they want you to? And the answer is yes, sure. It's, again, oral agreements are valid. They're just not enforceable. So like, for example, you know, I have a house then and the listing has expired and somebody calls me and says, hey, you know what? I really do want to buy that house. You know, can you see if you can arrange it? And I call the seller and I say, listen, you know, I know that we took it off the market. I do have a buyer, are you interested? And they say, sure, and we go into it. You know, ultimately what you would want to do is reactivate that listing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, however, it, again, it's, you go into the paperwork. You want to reactivate it because you, you want to have, <laughs> you want credit. <laughs> you know, because right now, you know, if you have that listing up there and you put it under agreement, and then you get credit through MLS and through the rankings and the ratings and, and all that data. Remember, we just talked about it going from that. It's data centric now. So you want, you're gonna to wanna to have your data to report as much of your activity as possible. I used to like to not put a lot like my private stuff on there because I liked it to fly under the radar. You know, and I didn't really like people to know exactly what it was I was doing. You know, however, now that when you go and you go to realtor.com and you hover over an area and up pops the highest producing agents in that area, it, with their reviews, mm. you bet your ass I want my name to be up there, you know, if I've, if I've gotten them. I don't, you know what I mean? So now it's a different story, you know? Um, anyways, we talked about these. They're the same kind of thing. Are there any questions on this? Are there any questions on what I've said? Yeah? Just a quick head by owner. Um, the realtors that bring people in, do they ask them there and yes. then what the compensation will be to get them to sign something? Well, here's the thing. Is a realtor by, real, uh, realtor by owner. Um, mm. For sale by owners can follow different paths and one of them is they stick a sign out there or they stick it on truly or zillow and there's no promise of compensation to the buyer's agent so what that buyer's agent would do is they would contact that that seller and say i have a buyer for this are you willing to compensate me and that buyer will either say and most of the time buyers know buyer buyers are so damn smart like they know they know what the going the going rate is they know all that stuff and sure they go yeah we honor realtors it'll be you know blah 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 so you know Sellers, yes, what did I say? Okay, fine. Well, I meant buyers are smart. Also, yeah. okay. they, they all, I mean, yes, sellers, I did mean smellers, sellers. Smellers are smart. <laughs> smellers are smart. <laughs> Get some, whatever, I'm not going there, right? Mariah tells my husband I swear a lot in here. <laughs> okay, now have you ever heard her talk? <laughs> ben, you've heard her, right? I have. She's got the biggest party mouth going. And so, she, we all have the house. <laughs> no, I do not swear. I do not swear in front of my children normally, you know. So that's why I think she's been surprised. But she goes and she tattles on me. So it's a smart fella. Anyway, so yes, it's this. I'm, and now here I am off topic. Yes. So normally they know, and you go to them, and they will pay you. If they don't, it would be your responsibility in order to get compensated to get it from your buyer, which is happening more and more often. And it's something that as you get into real estate now, you have to have the communication skills to communicate that your value add to your buyer your value proposition, okay? So if it's going direct. Because there's a lot of stuff that happens and a lot of things fall apart. But you'll have help with that when you get there. But yes, that's a really good question. But that's the idea. You're putting it on for sale by owner because you don't want to pay a commission. You know, and honestly, when people come to me and like, like they're like borderline on, I'm like, throw it on yourself and see if you can do it. You know, call me like, like you know, when you, when you need me. Because I don't, I don't want to be trying to like peddle them for that and have them not feel like, if they feel like they can truly do it themselves, I'm like, go do it yourself then. And then come back if you want. Like, you know, I'm always here for you. I'll help you with anything. But, uh, okay, so listings. Um, the, the, the thing that talks about is the expiration of the listing period. 
um, we just talked about this a little. Sometimes there's an automatic automatic extension clause in our in our menu of services where they pay us up front in order to list it for them. We automatic it automatically renews, right? And so we just click until they sell it or until they cancel it. All right. Most of the time on listing agreements in in house, we don't have an automatic extend. Okay, you need to sit down and talk to that client again. We use that as an opportunity for price breaks, you know. Um, and that broker protection clause, that's the period of, you know, 30, 60, 90 days that you put in there, um, how, whatever it is that you put in that protects you after that happens. Okay, I do want to tell you, this is, if, if they have it listed with Converse, right, we'll use Converse, and it expires with Converse, and the buyer that was looking at it did not buy it at that time, and it was listed three days later with Robert Paul, that and that buyer came back, Converse does not have a piece of that, okay? Because they are no longer the listing agent and that buyer is coming from wherever the buyer is coming from. So do you understand? So in that period where before it gets listed again, and if that buyer came back, then that listing agency might have a, a claim to it. But once it gets listed with somebody else, it then becomes that listing becomes their property and their rights to, to the commission, okay? Um, we always mourn the loss of our listings, <laughs> you know, because it's really frustrating because you've worked so hard and then they go with somebody else and they give the price that you've been begging for and, and you're always like, son of a, like why don't they give me a chance, you know. Um, so the listing presentation is, it's called a lot of things now, you know, that we try to, we try to get away from calling it a CMA, but everybody calls it a CMA. Like when they call you, they say, can I have a CMA? Now most people don't even know what CMA stands for. And um, it stands for comparative market analysis. Right now, sometimes they call uh, what a listing proposal, a marketing proposal. Um, you know, so they try to give it a little bit more of a more of a specialized why we're special kind of title. Because remember, we all have the same data for the for the souls. So we're all analyzing the exact same houses, right? So that's not going to be what makes us special. Our number is not what's going to be what makes us special. It's all that other stuff that's going to make us special. So a lot of times in our listing presentation, our goal is not to give them that number, which is what most people want, quite frankly. It's to tell them why we're special. You know, and that's one of the reasons why we bought the Matterport, was because we wanted to be special. And we're the only company that has them, in like, the, like anywhere in this area. So, you know, so that's one of the reasons. What are you laughing at back there? My hands? No, not you. My, my breast stroke? No, not you okay. at all. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so that's so that's one of the reasons why you you would change the name that actually shows up on our CMA. Okay. And everybody else has to, quite honestly, because we all want to try to establish our strategic differentiation. Um, the information that's needed for the listing presentation. Again, at least talk to you a little bit about appraisals, and we'll touch on them again just to make sure that you guys are all clear on it. When a house gets, the process of a house goes from you list the property, a buyer is found, you come up with what is the market value, which is the amount you're willing to sell it for, the amount they're willing to, to, uh, to buy it for, right? So that's what market value is. That is on the test, by the way. Market value is the amount that the seller is willing to sell it for and the buyer is willing to buy it for, okay? So it does not have to do with anything else. When they ask you market value, that's the number they're looking for, okay? So anyways, you have the market value number of what the person's willing to pay. You go into the paperwork, purchase and sales, mortgage company is hired, the mortgage company then sends out the paperwork. Two things happen in the mortgage company. One is that the, the client, the buyer, gets qualified. The other thing is that the house gets qualified. And part of that house qualification is that it appraises out. Okay, so that information needed, that's where the comps come in. And that's why <laughs> if you ever do a market analysis for somebody, and <laughs> I just had this conversation with my dad, and he goes, well, you know, why wouldn't we be turning $1,000 higher so we get the listing? I'm like, because it won't appraise out. So what good does it do to have it if we can't sell it? Number one, the other thing is everybody knows what the market, I mean, like everybody knows what the numbers are. You know, there's not a ton of, of analytics that go into that actual sold number. You know what I mean? That's what the number that the bank's going to appraise it at. That's pretty strong. I mean, that's pretty clear. With some, I mean, 
for our purposes, that's very clear. In, that, in my opinion, it's clear. Okay, disclosures. You need to go through that agency disclosure with them. There's different um, lead paint disclosures. There's other things that go into that, that presentation. The, the paperwork that you go through is now on a, um, on a computer. It's through a, a system. And what most people do is they have their templates. So there's all of the listing paperwork that you're going to need in the template. For buyers, there's a template that has all the buying information. You know, like if the house has lead paint. Like any house, you know, before 1978 needs a lead paint disclosure, you know. So anyways. Is there a form, a disclosure form that, that they fill out? There wasn't when yes. I was working. Is there one? Really? Yes, there is. There is one. And it's, uh, it's actually an 11 page, uh, 10 pages of information and one page of disclosure. And yes, it has to be done. And, and you as a... You know, we're always like trying to be cheap about our paper, you know, and, and it's like you have to give that paperwork out to them. And I really recommend you do because sometimes they're like, well, I'll just email to them. I'll have proof that I sent it. I'll have proof that they got it. I'll be covered. You're not covered. You're supposed to go through that paperwork with them like, like this. Okay. Okay. So here are some things that go on the, li the, the listing contract. The names of the people. All right. So it's your friend, or you're kind of doing it on the fly, and you know, so you write down like, you know, Becky Miller. So Becky's not her real name, right? And so, uh, and she probably has a middle initial. So from the beginning, get their right names, their legal names, okay? Because Becky Miller is not the name she's gonna sign, okay? And it's important, because you're gonna need that name. Because if you start off as Becky Miller on the listing agreement, then it comes time to generate the purchase and sales agreement. Guess what name gets, gets populated? Mm -hmm. Becky Miller, right? So you have to go back and change it. So just start from the beginning. Be a pro. Uh, the brokerage firm, the description of the premises. Again, we talked about the legal description and what that is in Massachusetts. You know, when you have the opportunity on that form I just told you about in that template, it asks you what's the legal description. And that'd be where you put something like a single family dwelling located on 0.56 acres, Further identified uh, in Plymouth County Registry of Deeds, you know, book this, page that, map this, lot that. It started here because you're going to need it later, so why not have it there, right? The other thing is you are establishing yourself as the professional, and you're also feeling, and you're giving yourself some credibility when you have, when you have it filled in this way. And it's all typed in from the computer. Um, the listing price, uh, broker's authorities and responsibilities, that, that kind of covers what it is that you're going to do for them. The compensation, okay, so the listing, the listing agreement will identify what the total compensation is and also what you're going to be paying the buyer's agent, okay, so what you're going to be offering them, and also a facilitator. So it's all spelled out on that. Um, if there's any leased equipment, so you want to find out, like is the oil tank leased or is the, is the, the propane tank leased? What's leased? What, is, what are you going to know? What are you going to need to know is leased when it comes time to actually transfer that title? Like, what transfers with it? You know, I have to be honest, I never ask what's leased. You know, and every time I teach this, I'm like, I'm going to start asking what's leased. <laughs> but I never do. Um, evidence of ownership. Okay, so uh, proposed dates for closing of possession. So in the listing contract, um, you know, you really don't talk about the dates of closing of possession, you know, because you, uh, you don't have an offer yet. However, it is nice to know what the person's time frame is. You know, so if you take a listing and you know that they don't plan on moving out until September or something, you know, you want to make sure you identify that because you're going to want to communicate that to the, to the potential buyers. You know, um, same thing with closing. When it is that they want to close? Okay, evidence of ownership. What's our evidence of ownership? Deeds, right. So, so uh, and they will often, some people have their deeds. There's a spot like right on the listing agreement that says has deed, ha does not have deed, right? So you can always get the deed, a copy of it, right on the, mostly, on the, on the website, okay? Now, you have to pay for that, so sometimes we just make it like a fake copy for it for that purpose, it's just to prove that they have the, the ownership of it. We also have public records, right, that we talked about. I mean, you pull up public records, it says who the person is that owns it. You go to town hall, you look at the town hall, like the records that they have. So you have all of these bricks in place of ownership. So you feel pretty confident that the person owns it. Who was talking about the other day about, about having to get signatures from everybody? That's one thing that happens is that if it's more than, like if it's several owners, and the only, they only show you like the first two, is in that particular case, 
you're going to want to make sure you've done your due diligence to, to make sure. So always check the deed. You know, and again, you don't have to print it at that point in time. You don't need it then, but you need to read it. Um, any encumbrances? Who remembers what encumbrance means? Um, mortgage. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You guys are awesome. You guys are working it. Okay, if there's a home warranty on it, um, termination uh, broker protection clause. Uh, again, that, that's the thing I talked about, that, that carryover, if someone had come during that time. Uh, warranties by the owner. Like, what are they warranty? Like, is there a roof warranty? You know, is there a, is there a, is there a Terminex? you know, warranty. Whatever they have, that will be carried over to the next person. That's valuable to a potential buyer. So you're going to want to identify those things. Okay, otherwise you write in like great big letters, like none. You know, there's no warranties. You know, we capitalize it. We do, seriously. Like just saying that this is what they're getting. Warranties, okay, in, indemnification wording. Um, there's indemnification uh, wording right into the, 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 uh, the contract. And I will tell you, sometimes after you've done a few of these, like, we get a tendency to just go to where the dashes are that we have to fill in, and we don't actually read through with them. As establishing yourself as a professional, right, you're going to want to read it with them and go through even the chapters or the paragraphs that don't have lines to fill in. Okay, one of them is the indemnification, and the other one is the non-discrimination. Okay, this is a great time to tell them that you can't discriminate. You know, I had, I've had several times people who want to discriminate about who they're selling their house to. And remember, you can't do that. They may be able to, but you can't. So this is a good time to know. You know, I, I tell a story like there was a one time that Denise and I uh, had a listing and we went there and a couple silly things happened. But anyways, we would, as we left, I mean, you know, they have little dogs and whatever. And as we left, uh, I called the guy and I said, you know, they didn't really, you know, it wasn't for them or whatever. He goes, good, I don't want any black people buying my house. I'm like, how'd you know they were black? It's like, oh, I have a video for my dogs. I'm like, disclosure, please. You know. So, anyways, um, you, they can't discriminate. Oh God, that was that was frightening. But just on a point, a lot of houses have that now. Okay, so you can ask them, like, what they have for recording things. There's different there's different criteria that they do that that would that would say like if there's a something in the window that has a picture of it or something that they don't have to tell you per se, okay? Um, signatures, you need signatures of everybody. So husband and wife you need signatures of. A lot of times you'll only be meeting with one of them and um, you, need, you need everybody's signatures, technically speaking. A lot of times what it will do is we'll get the ball rolling with one of the signatures, have them electronically have the other people sign it and send it back, okay? Um, this tends to be a hands-on activity. However, in a situation like this, it may even be a hands-on activity where they electronically sign in front of you if they're going to have to send it off to somebody, okay? Just so that you can go through this and establish that personal information with them, but also have it so that you can, you can do your loop when you need to. Okay, and then the date. Dates are always needed in order for uh, an agreement or any sort of uh, contract to be binding, okay? So, any questions on that? Again, as you see the paperwork, we're not going to go through the paperwork today. It's in your book, the listing agreements, I think. But we're not going to cover them because the actual language on them and whatever is not on the test. And I don't want you to get tied up in it. Okay, just, so um, just one quick question. Um, if there are any specific um, things that we need to know, like a, um, a s security system, or yes. is that all All that information, is that all? You will have like a checklist where that information would come in handy. And and actually, I do recommend you put it like there's a spot on the MLS for like firm remarks, which only like your firm can see, or private remarks. So you're going to want to put maybe that information in there so that, you know, um, you can access it quickly. I'll tell you what's happened to me a few times. Not to me, I don't know anybody else, but I put it right on my phone because of my notes, and then my phone dies. And then I'm like, oh, God, was it 2648? Was it, you know, so, so you want to make sure that you're able to, to have it, like, in another spot that you can actually access it. Um, that's a really good question. The other thing um, that you would want to put in the listing agreement is any exclusions, mm -hmm. right? Like that chandelier we talked about, that damn chandelier. Mm -hmm. You know, the, ex the, ex the, the chandeliers, the exclusions, and also what is included. You know, kitchen appliances, household appliances. We like to say that you give the appliances and as is condition of some sort or you give them as gifts so there's no warranties. You know, so there's some language like that. But that's what about excluding 
their neighbor if, if, the, if they oh, might think somebody exclusions. might come along even though they've listed the property. Yes, you would also put the exclusions of, of people. Like if they said, you know, I've been waiting, you know, this guy has said that he wants to buy this. All right, I have a listing appointment next week with one of those people from the Facebook thing. And they said, but I've been talking to this person and I've been kind of holding out because I think they might buy it. So I said, we can list them as an exclusion. You give it a deadline, because I say, if they haven't bought it by that, that point in time, then they're probably not going to be buying it. So, you know, give it a deadline, because you don't want to go <laughs> through the whole thing, and then, you know, three months down the lane, you've, you know, you've got another buyer, and they say, well, my friend would have paid $5,000 more. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of, so you, you want to just have a date on that. But yes, that's where you'd list the exclusions mm -hmm. of the people. Do you guys understand what, that, what I'm talking about? Okay. So, thank you for telling me that. So, what he, she's asking is, if a person wants to buy the house, that might have an interest in the house and has, ex, has expressed interest, but that person still wants to go forward to try to sell the house, so they want to list it, can you list that person as like a person that you're not going to get compensated for? Like, so you don't get the commission, you know, it's like an exclusive right to sell, but they are re retaining the right for these special people that they might know of. A lot of times it's like the children. You know, um, you know, this will really make my child know that I'm serious when I list it, but you know, they might want to buy it. So you list their names, and that means that they are excluded from the agreement, okay, um, and the contract. Contract and agreement mean the same thing, you know. Contract sounds scarier than agreement. So when you're being nice with them and you're trying to, like, create this sense of trust, you say agreement. When they want their son to come in and buy it, you say contract, you know. <laughs> we have a contract, right? So um, anyway, <laughs> buyer representation. Uh, when you're representing the buyer, the representation agreement that you would use is the exclusive buyer representation agreement, okay? Um, and what you want to do is you want to establish, the buyer agency agreement is, in my opinion, is most critical for education, for teaching them. Okay, listen, if you go to an open house and or my cousin, if you stop at a house that's getting a sign put up and you decide that you gotta like chit chat, like you may have like ruined the foundation for me to, to represent you. So you say to them, like, I wanna go to open houses with you. If I can't go to the open house with you, here's the steps we wanna take. Here's the way that we establish this agreement. This is what you wanna do with me. Like this is how you, you know, we work together on this. This is what procuring causes. Now you don't wanna make it all about you. And you don't want to make it like, you know, like this is how I have what you have to do so I get paid. That's not a value add to them, right? What you want to do is educate them because what will happen a lot of times is that person will call you if you don't do this, and they call you on the phone, you know, on, on normally Monday morning because it's after the open house weekend, and they're like, Katie, great news! I'm like, I'm like, yes, 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 right? They go, I found a house. And I'm like, good. They're like, I went to the open house yesterday. I loved it. I put an offering with the person there. I I'm buying that house. It's beautiful. You want to go see it with me? And I'm like, not only do I not want to see it with you, I can't stand you. You know? <laughs> but you don't want to say that because, again, it's all about relationships. But now, like, they're doing this whole thing, but they want you to be happy for them. They seriously, because you've established this relationship with them, and you've told them that you guys are together, and, like, you're, like you have started a relationship with them. So you're supposed to, as a relationship partner, be happy. However, they don't understand that you just screwed them for the, the commission, right? So they don't understand that. So they're like, well, why aren't you happy for me? I'm like, well, because now I don't get paid, you know, because they don't get that piece. It doesn't make sense to them. They don't connect the dots. We have to connect the dots for you, for them. They honestly cannot connect the dots. They have no idea that they're screwing you out of commission. They have no idea how you get paid unless you tell them. Okay, so it is a conversation worth having that. Let me explain how it works in real estate. We get compensated by the completion of agreements, okay? So when I'm not part of that, I don't get compensated, you know? So let's work together to make sure that we both establish a win-win, okay? I mean, they don't know. They, they think that you, they think, they may think that this is a job that you punch in when you get here and you punch out when you leave. And they may think that they're helping you by doing that work by themselves. You don't know. I will tell you this. People think they're bothering you by asking you to go to open houses with them. They're like, you know what, I don't, I don't think it's for me, but I really want to go to the open house. I don't want to bother you. You have your family. You know, so they go through these things, and they're trying to be kind because you have this relationship with you. And they want to be part of the relationship. They want to be considerate. They don't want to make you run all around with them. But what they, they don't understand that the nicest thing they can do for you is to, to, to bring you along. Okay? You have to establish that. So the buyer 
the buyer agreement says that. And as I said, you people who are getting started will have no problem with buyer agency agreements. It's the people who started when we didn't have them, and then now they have to incorporate them. That's a little like we stumble over our words sometimes. So what do I say to those people that are stumbling over their words? Pick up your audio and practice, right? And practice and practice and practice until you can say it and you know what to say and, you, and you're comfortable with saying it and you're not stammering over the words, right? You're doing that, that relationship a favor, you know? All right, I feel like sometimes I just beat something right into the ground and uh, I gotta get myself back a little, okay? I don't know why we're two chapters behind on our schedule. <laughs> okay, termination of buyer representation agreement. The purpose of the agreement is fulfilled. The term expires. Mutual agreement, breach, or either party dies or is incapacitated. Okay, so there's one situation that happens frequently in which someone calls on the phone or you establish this, but they don't want to be tied down to you. They want to be able to do their thing with other people. Okay, so they don't want to enter into a buyer representation agreement with you. Okay, you have the choice at that point in time whether you want to work with them or not. Some people are like, yeah, I'll still work with them. I'll still give them some time, you know, because, you know, it could work and, you know, I might find it for them. And if I'm doing my job, I will find the house for them. And then other people are like, you know what, screw it. I don't have that much time to be working with people who are dating other people, you know, dating other buyer's agents. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of, I mean, like, I remember one guy said that to me and he's, you know, oh, yeah, I'd love to, you to show me those houses, but I just want you to know, like, I use other buyer agents. And I'm like... <laughs> Why don't you call them? You know, because I don't. I don't want to have that kind of. I don't want to date. I don't want to date my buyers. You know, I want a committed relationship. So um, I know, and I know that sounds really silly, but it's. You know, you can make more money, you can get more things, but you cannot make more time. And my time is too valuable to be spending with those people who want to cheat on me with other buyer agents or go by themselves to open houses. That's a decision you'll make at the beginning. You'll probably say, "I'll do whatever," but then once you start getting burned, guess what happens? Not only are you not getting paid, you're starting to hate your profession because people aren't doing what you thought they would and they're not being the people that you thought they were gonna be. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing because we haven't really told them. But they're not doing what, what our expectation is and now we're feeling like, oh my God, it's happened to me again or just my luck. And I'm like, there's no such thing as just my luck on buyers and buyer agents agreements, okay? It's just my, go through it and treat it like a business and treat it like, you know, <laughs> The profession that you are trying to get into. People who use these think that people who don't are crazy. Okay. And you guys are like, yes, after this unit, she's off. Stop. She's gonna stop talking about this. This is important because you know what? I see people talk, I see people get so disappointed because of these things. Okay, and I think that a lot of it is preventable. And I don't think it's a lot, I don't think that any of these things are unreasonable. So the same thing, you're gonna review this, you're gonna go to quiz bank. You guys had no trouble with the quiz banks. Did anyone do like the, the unit one, unit three, mix and match them so that you had the context taken out? Pretty cool, huh? Wicked cool, right? <laughs> it is wicked cool, I think so. Anyway, let's do a couple questions. All right, a broker sold the residence for $485,000 and received $26,675 as commission in accordance with the listing agreement. What was the broker's commission rate? No one has their little boards out, do you? Five and a half, you say? Anybody else got five and a half? Yep. Five point five. Good job. Which brings up that point that I talked about before. It doesn't have to be a solid number for a commission rate, you know. So there's like if for some reason the person says, "Can you give me a little break?" or blah blah blah, or you're really truly trying to make numbers work, you know, it could be five point seven five or five point five or whatever. Um, most people don't think like that. A seller listed a property with a broker under an exclusive agency listing agreement. If the seller finds a buyer, the seller will owe the broker no commission, the full commission, a partial commission, only reimbursement for broker's costs. Um, nothing. Nothing, right? Right. So, again, this is a decision that you enter into when you enter that agreement. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> you wish you could say, all right, can you just pay for the advertising I did? Can you pay for my time? And can you pay for my, the Matterport? And can you pay for this? They don't have to do that. Okay, what so percent, again, what? What percentage of uh, the, those type of agreements are, are taken back? Right. I didn't think so. No, on, when, when someone goes to list it for themselves and uses that menu of services that we have, they would, ha they would do an exclusive agency listing agreement. Right. And that's probably about, like normally in the course of like 
whatever we have listed at time is the only one or two that are. So, go ahead. I forget the term that you used for it, but we talked about it earlier with um with the old lady wanting to sell her net listing. Two thousand net listing. So I know you said that's illegal, but it, would it be illegal to say okay five percent commission for two hundred thousand and anything over two hundred thousand, then I'll give you ten percent commission. No, that would not be illegal, but it might not be practical, you know. But it's a really good point because I was on my way home from that thing yesterday and talking to another expert in the industry who's very well regarded, and she said she feels our commission structure is going to change. And I said, Why? Right? Me, because I, you know, I want the money. I'm like, Why? And so she says, Because it's ridiculous that for a $500,000 house, people are, are paying $25,000 if that house gets sold. You know, within, you know, up in the Boston area, they get sold in a pretty reasonable, fast period of time. So she feels like it's it's, it's not com commiserate. I think is the word I'm looking for. But it's not doesn't the twenty five thousand dollars does not equal the, the amount of work that we do for that five hundred thousand dollar listing. So in that kind of situation, you know, sometimes a higher end property, their anticipation would be that they're not paying like the, the commission that you'd normally charge for like a lower one. You know, so um, so it's it, it depends on the reason why you'd be doing it. You know. Um, Actually, that would be in the reverse of what he's saying. Right. It would be. You know what I mean? The more you get, usually they want less commission. So say, because then at the end, say say you end up, you know, you're anticipating 200000 but, you know, there was unforeseen things, then it drops down to 100000 So if you're already at five, you want to at least say, okay, well, if we get down here, then I want ten then your work, you're getting paid based on that commission. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, same I will, work. I will tell you, $100,000 listings are like harder often than a $500,000 listing. Mm -hmm. And you do more running. And you know what? And, and, I've, and I've tried to think of why. And I'll tell you why I, why I think. Because if someone's buying a house for $100,000, probably that's, if it's like a first-time home buyer or someone entering my, that's all they got. Like they are, they are, they are starting their American dream, and that's like the nickels that they can rub together, that they can figure out how to start buying a house. So it's everything to them. Ordinarily, on a five hundred thousand dollar property, the people are a little bit more financially sophisticated. You know, they have credit, they have resources, they have you know those kind of things, and so to them, it's it's not the same. So they can treat it more like a like a business transaction or a financial transaction rather than you know, my heart going into this house. Of course, unless the hundred thousand dollars is like a, an investor, then it's completely off, you know, opposite. But when it's a consumer and a first-time home buyer, they, they they tend to be a lot of more steps, more rewarding too. I think all of us would rather take a first-time home buyer than anybody, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're just so grateful. They just think you're wonderful, you know. And and, and and that doesn't happen a lot with, you know, people who do it every day. You know, um, they get more like what Russ was talking about, like what you got to do for me. All right, let's do one more. The final decision on a property's asking price should be made by the seller's broker, appraised value, seller, or seller's attorney. C. C, the seller, absolutely. So that's the other thing is, I think it's Dave, right? You always say like, you decide what you're charging. I, like, I have to tell them I, I don't make any decisions. Right. About anything. Right, so you give them the information and you let them decide it, Tomorrow. you know, ultimately. Because you don't ever want them to come back and say, you told me I could sell it for this much money. Or you said list it for this. So you want to position yourself to say, I gave you, based on the numbers, my professional opinion on what could be supported and what I thought, you know, and there's charts that show like at this much money, how fast and how much it might sell for and like there's, there's statistics. But you never want to be the source of the source on that. You want them to be and that they picked it out. Also, if the house sells quickly, then they think mm -hmm. you set the price and they think you Underpriced, underpriced it. it. Right, and which is funny, which is an I irony, which we'll talk about probably in, at some point in time, but what is what, yeah. Lindsay? There's a question on this quiz, and it says, and I just heard this from someone recently, that if the seller gets an full offer, cash, yep. from a buyer, and decides not to sell, I thought they had to sell, but do not. it just says they have to pay commission. They don't actually, the way that the, the, it says is that you get paid if it's ready, willing, and able buyers. Technically, right. Technically, according to this protection written into the paperwork that mostly said that they don't pay it unless you get unless it gets closed. But yeah, it'd be nice if we got paid. We never they get don't paid. Have to sell it if they have 
I don't know, Paula might have gotten paid. Have you ever gotten paid on one that didn't go through? Yes. yes. <laughs> so Paula's the only <laughs> one of us brave enough to ask her that kind of money. But um, yeah. On the high street right near the hospital. Yeah. So, um, but I, I sure as hell haven't, you know. The um, but has changed a little bit in the P&S because before it was the regular state form um, just said that without added language that attorney has now that we would get compensated. Yeah. And it didn't say if it closed. Right. It didn't. And and, and then the lawyers will go in and write that in that it's at the closing. Um, but yeah, technically I guess you're supposed to, you do have a right to it. But the, the practical matters is, is if there's no transaction you almost never do. But I will also tell you it's not very often that you have a ready, willing, and able buyer at full cash price it's at a solid as it like do back hand springs. You know, so, um, you know, most of the time, by the time, not too many people say to you, let's just throw my house on the market just to test the waters, and let's just throw it out there, and if it sells, it sells, and if it doesn't, I don't care, no big deal, let's just see what happens. You know, they don't normally do that. And you know what, and I also want to caution you, as a professional, again, back to that time, is like, no matter what the listing is, it takes you time. So, you know, those, whatever, let's just try it out, let's see, you know, that, that ends up harming you. Again, that's yeah. So it, it's it, it's tricky. It can be tricky. And and you know what? I would I would say like in a situation like that, go with it because they're going to have to sell. So even if that person got walked, you know they're going. You know you probably wouldn't get commission by practical matters. However, you would get paid when they sell it. So I would I would stay I would stay in there for that. It's just you know when you have that person that's you know just let's see you know. And if someone does say that. You know, as a professional, you probably don't want to spend that much time doing their things. You know, like you don't want to invest a ton of time. You know, I have one person who like they put their house on the market when they see a house they like, and then when that house sells or expires or whatever, they take the house off the market. Mm -hmm. And then it, if they see something out there like they put the house back on the market, to, to, it, so it's ridiculous. I should fire them. <laughs> okay. Charge them for advertising. Uh, I know that's what you'd say, but yeah, someday yeah. it'll work, right? You know what? It's it's a relationship building. You know, nine times out of ten, I think I've told you, most of the people I work with are people who are near and dear to my heart. So it's a little hard. I don't work with many, you know, whatever. Okay, so we're good on this chapter.